Welcome back to the Inking Out Loud podcast, fellow nerds. On this 17th episode, we are diving back once again into Matthew Woodring Stover's The Acts of Cain. The subject of discussion today is Book 3, Cain Black Knife, also known as the first of The Acts of Atonement, the duology that ends Stover's sci-fi fantasy series. I've said this before, and I will absolutely need to say it again, right here, right now. These books are violent. They are gruesome. They are beautiful. Before going on, this is your official warning. We are not going to censor this episode. After all, how can you censor an episode based on a book with so many delightful new phrases to add to your daily vernacular, (laughs) right? So now that we've got that out of the way, I'm your host, Rob Santos. I'm joined once again by my ever-faithful co-host, Mr. Drew McCaffrey. How's it going? And we're lucky enough once again, everyone, to have Mr. Patrick McCaffrey with us today as well. Howdy, everybody. Top of the afternoon, gentlemen. How's it going? I say, rather. (laughs) Where are we going to start? Because this was uh, an interesting read, I suppose, is the word I'm going to use for that one. Um, Yeah. (laughs) It was definitely a bit of a different experience. Drew, start us off, man. Let's, let's uh, Let's get a bit of a recap. Yeah, so this book, you, you know, we, we've talked about in in the first four episodes covering Kane about how Heroes Die and Blade of Tyshal are very different books from each other. They, they fit overall as books in the same series, but they do very different things. And once again, we have a very different kind of book here with Kane Blackknife. And uh, so this book takes place three years after the events of Blade of Tyshal, probably... Uh, <laughs> Probably. It's debatable. Um, but it, it follows two uh, separate narratives. Um, there's there's the one narrative that definitely takes place three years after Blade of Taishal, and that follows Kane as he returns to the, uh, the Bodecan, the site of his first famous adventure as an actor 25 years ago, and it's a very different place now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he goes through... Um, uh, a series of intrigues where he's chasing after his adopted Ogreloy brother Orbeck Blackknife, who uh, who has become the Quachar or the leader of the remaining Blackknife uh, Ogreloy, uh, despite the fact that the clan itself was almost completely destroyed 25 years ago due to Kane's actions. Uh, but but uh, Kane gets embroiled in several different conspiracies in the town of Perthens Ford, which is run by the Knights of Krill, who are these sort of, you know, warriors of truth and justice. They worship the sun god Krill. They're 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 superheroes essentially. They they're <laughs> crazy fast, strong, they have healing abilities, all this stuff. Uh, but they've enslaved the remaining Ogreloy. And so Kane is there to to find what Orbeck is up to and uh and and he Finds out there's an Ankanan insurgency that's been set up by Kirindal, of course, because she has to have her fingers in everywhere. <laughs> he finds out that Tapas, the uh, monastic Kainist, with whom uh, Kane spent some time in the pit in Blade of Tyshell, is now the undercover monastic ambassador in Perthens Ford. And, uh, and then he meets uh, Angvas Claylock, who is the new champion of Krill, uh, and she was raised three years ago, so right after Assumption Day, uh, when Kane killed Mylekoth at the end of Blade of Taishal. And and at the end of this whole sequence, Kane is betrayed and is turned over, as we discover, to a bunch of Artans and Akhtiri who run the Blackstone Mining Corporation, and is in turn given to the social police and brought back to Earth, where he offers to make a deal with the Board of Governors. And then the other narrative... <laughs> is the story of Retreat from the Bodecan. 25 yeah. years ago, Kane's first famous adventure, how Kane became Kane, how he destroyed the Black Knife Nation, um, how he met Arturo Kohlberg and, and got his real uh, star career off the ground and all of this. Uh, but the way it's framed is that this isn't just telling the story of Retreat from the Bodecan. It's somebody actually watching mm-hmm. Retreat from the Bodecan. The master and they're version, fast yeah. forwarding and and mm. skipping sections. And at the end of this book, the impression we're given is that it was Rababal, who was one of the other actors on Retreat from the Bodecan with Kane, 
presumed dead at the time. Rub-a-ball. He's not dead. And his, his real name is Simon Fowler, and he is in charge of the Blackstone Mining Corporation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty succinct uh, outline there. <laughs> Thank you. Because I, I have to start this off again uh, by saying that I, well, I'm back to work now. I'm working 60 to 70 hours a week. I'm going to, I'm welding the entire time. So I'm back to listening to audiobooks, unfortunately. Um, it's yeah. good on one hand because, I mean, I have 11, 12 hours a day to just knock books out of the way. I can knock the largest book out of the way in just a couple of days now. But unfortunately, there are, there is a little bit here and there that I'm kind of not hearing. I'm, I'm not catching up on or picking up on, I should say. So I really appreciate the, uh, that primer that we got there, Drew. Yeah. Um, and especially with, Cain Black Knife, and and you'll see even more so with Cain's Law, Book Four, the the second Act of Atonement. These books get a little wonky. They get a little hard yeah. to follow at I'll, points. Yeah. <laughs> um, there there's some new things Stover's doing in this. Um, for one thing, he for the first time, you know, we we talked about back in Heroes Die and Blade of Taishal, how Stover does interesting things with point of view. Yes. Where uh, we have first and third person point of view uh, chapters, and, and usually that indicates, like, like third person in Heroes Die was Hari back on Earth, and then first person was, like, first person present instead of third person past, and it was Kane monologuing while he's on Overworld, while mm-hmm. he's connected, you know, to the Thought Knitter. And obviously that's kind of changed a bit now, but in this book... We have a new phenomenon where, for the first time, Matthew Stover is using the second-person point of view. Yeah. And we have one, maybe two, maybe three different characters talking to Kane in the second person. Yeah. Uh, it's not entirely clear. Uh, certainly, the book starts off with Milkoff mm-hmm. talking to Kane, But as the book goes on, there are points where it's like, is this still Milkoff? Is this... Uh, the outside power, the Dil Talon, that uh, the the Black Knife God, with whom Cain was connected way back during retreat from the Bodekin, is this maybe Rabobal talking to himself to Cain as he's watching it? Like there there are weird things uh, going on with this, and then even more than that, there are weird things with time that happen in this book. Um, Specifically, atop uh, the purific apex of the spire, yeah, in the hand was... of peace, and and this is actually a carryover from Blade of Taishal, where that final scene when when Cain kills Milkov is written in this uh, infinite now kind of yeah. time frame. It's it's I do this because I have always done this, and and that's brought back a couple of times in this book. And as we find out now, it is the result of the direct touch of a God. Hmm. So there are wonky things happening here. I can definitely sympathize with the difficulty of tackling this particular book on audio, especially for the first time. It was confusing Um, as shit. Yeah. uh, For me as well. Um, found myself asking what the fuck is going on and <laughs> where are the and like what yeah. and yeah. it's it's not just the fault of the audiobook like the narrative is as yes. has been said it is, is challenging wonky. it jumps hither and thither yes um, stover is a patch on what's coming in the, <laughs> Kane's in the next book. but oh but, really uh, it's like a it's like oh, this, is a warm crazy, up, this is the warm up round it's the tutorial yeah ah well, it like, establishes, like... <laughs> but it, it, the book actually, one of its purposes in my mind is to establish some of the conceptual themes of this jumping uh, around in time and the uh, the eternal now. Yes. And, uh... Yeah, and, and so okay. uh, as, as we were talking a little bit before we started recording, when we were deciding uh, where we're going to chop Kane's Law in half, because we're going to do two episodes for that. Uh, we were talking about chapter names and how the chapters in Kane's Law aren't numbered. And what they are is is they have sort of chapter titles and chapter subtitles. And most of the chapter titles repeat. And one of the main repeating chapter titles is called The Now of Always. Oh, And really? that is this, this sense, this eternal now okay, that okay. we're talking about. And... and uh, and there are other things like yesterday's tomorrow and tomorrow's yesterday and things like that. And uh, and and then my favorite, there are several chapters prefaced with raining weird. 
what the fuck? Yeah, which which is actually a, a Kane line back in Blade of Tai Shao, where he really? talks about it's raining weird uh, huh. during the during the final like the social police attack on Ankana and yeah. and all the craziness that happens there. He talks about how it's raining weird, huh. and well, so so what what Kane Black Knife does is is it's easing us into this really high concept uh, like meta timeline deal that he's he's building toward in the culmination of this series and this is where i'm talking about it's a very different kind of book from heroes die or blade of tai shao oh huh. yeah i'll uh i'll admit that i mean like as patrick was saying there were plenty of times during the audiobook when i was sitting there having to rewind i was like what hold on it's it's only been 30 <laughs> yeah. seconds since i clued out and now i have no idea what's happening um, mm-hmm. it, Stover's not really one to give you a lot of context before kind of throwing you into a scene. Um, you no, kind of have to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he, he yeah. gives you information on a need to know basis. And, uh, that's of course, you know, assuming that you are following along closely, which is and, kind of and hard especially to do. in this book where yeah. we compare, you know, the length of heroes die, which was, you know, a reasonably solid, what, 580, 600 plus page fantasy novel sure, sure, and then yeah. blade of taishao which is a Huge. monster like 850 page oh yeah Kane black knife is 323 pages in the paperback yeah and when drew told yeah. me that i was like oh well that's no problem at all i'll be able to knock that out pretty <laughs> pretty fucking quick but then yeah bird bird seed i mean the audiobook is 14 it's just under 14 hours um if you're listening at you know obviously one time speed but even though it's only 14 hours i swear i must have spent at least 19 or 20 listening because i had to keep rewinding again and again and again and also when you're doing an in-depth uh, you know uh analyzation of for like for a podcast you spend a lot of time writing down interesting one-liners that you find here and there uh, which of course takes a lot longer. Um, we're gonna get to get to a whole bunch of those later in this in this podcast in this episode. But I I do want to focus like right now on, on what Stover accomplishes with uh, this narrative, despite its size. We get a much smaller, more intimate character study in this book, namely that of course yeah. of of Kane. We spend a lot more time in his head in first person, which depending on your artistic or even uh, intestinal sensibilities, I guess. It's it's either a good thing or a very, very bad thing. Um, and I, will I admit, find it a good thing. Yeah, I, I like in, it. In I, I definitely book. subscribe to Kane's brand of humor. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I love those dark <laughs> jokes. I love that uh, kind of irreverence with which he treats all of his surroundings. Um, uh, but uh, I don't know. Like, Kane, we, we definitely got what I consider maybe uh, too close of a look at who he is. Um, there were some, some moments that I was left blatantly disturbed with what he was saying, uh, what he was thinking. Uh, mm-hmm. it, 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 w- it was a little hard in areas. What about you guys? What do you think? Well, um, it was interesting to see the dichotomy between Kane then and Kane now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not going to go so far as to say that he was more innocent in, uh, in Retreat from the Bow Deccan, but he was certainly less scarred, and it showed. Yeah. Silver did a good job of that. Um, yeah. But it, it, his character later on seems to me merely the uh, uh, another step uh, down the, the, the logic tree that he's been headed this whole time. So it wasn't shocking in any, in any way. It was like, oh, this came out of nowhere kind of a shock. It may it might have been slightly sad. Um, okay. His irreverence is is still poignant, especially with uh, the Knights of Krill. Yeah, um, which is kind of a bummer in a way because the Knights of Krill uh, are start we're, we're starting to get some characters and some some ideas at least in the series that aren't just bleak and murderous, mm-hmm. but are actually like striving toward high ideals. And it's it's just kind of uncomfortable to see them shot down by Kane so yeah. vigorously, I suppose. Although I do find that it was refreshing how he, despite the fact that he didn't want to like some of them, he still found himself admitting, like, no, you're a good guy. Or, yeah. or, or specifically with Angvas, where he's, he's honestly kind of blown away at how just pure-hearted and upright and heroic this woman is mm-hmm. and how she she really is the champion of krill yeah she leaves yeah. an impression on him for sure she definitely does 
Uh, yeah. Do you I, do you guys get the feeling that he admires these people despite their beliefs? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Some of the language he uses uh, talking about Perth and Claylock uh, at the end of this book, who is obviously a man Kane does not get along with, no. uh, is, is nonetheless the language he uses to describe him is glowing in many ways. It's, it's uh, impressive. It's uh, complimentary. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, he turns around and <laughs> kills him. Yeah. But... <laughs> It, yeah. so, like, but that's Cain in a nutshell for uh, you know? yeah. it's like Cain is saying like, you know, these people that have these qualities that I admire are good despite their beliefs whereas they might say of themselves they are good because of it if they mm-hmm. admitted that they were good at all mm-hmm. Yeah. so there's an, uh, yeah, just another insight is if we <laughs> needed one into Cain's view of um, yeah. really organizations in general um, and it doesn't seem to discriminate between a government or a religion or uh, uh, even an informal sort of group like a thieves guild. Mm-hmm. Uh, he yeah. just he doesn't buy authority. He doesn't buy uh, <laughs> the group dynamic. I guess he, he just doesn't agree. He's such a lone wolf. He's such a lone wolf that he he, I, he could never picture himself being part of such a thing. Yeah, he doesn't want to um, trap and, himself and, with how he's supposed to act. You know. And so kind of on this idea of like where Cain stands as a person in in contrast to the these people around him, uh, I highlighted one point when he had been pulled in the middle of retreat from the Bodecan and he meets Arturo Kohlberg. And oh, he's yeah. Negotiating with Kohlberg about a bummer. what they're going to do to continue. And uh, and and he's talking about um, he says. He basically says, what was the chance? What was the part that made you decide to pull me to take this chance on me? And there's a little bit more. And he says, I bet I can tell you what it wasn't. It wasn't when I was making that speech about being legends. It wasn't when I sold everybody on the die fighting crap. It wasn't even when I went out alone and fought Spearboy. None of that hero shit. And then heroes sell Michelson. Sure they do. Hell, I like him too. What's not to like? You can't piss without splashing a hero <laughs> in this business. But you weren't out pimping Marades clips, were you? I'm not one of the good guys, Administrator. I am what I am. And this is a remarkable uh, statement by Stover, more so than Kane even, oh. that shows just how ahead of, ahead of his time Stover was in writing this book. What Kane just described right there, that is the reason why Grimdark Fantasy, why George R. R. Martin and Joe Abercrombie and Steven Erickson and Mark Lawrence and like the list goes on and on and on, why these guys are bestsellers now. Because everybody was so tired of just heroes, 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 heroes down the line. Mm-hmm. And Stover was ahead. Stover was the first one to write an anti-hero like sure. this. They had hero and, fatigue. And bring, and bring this like really gritty... And, and I will say, I'm not saying he's like the first one to write an anti-hero ever. Sure. Not, yeah. I mean, there were plenty of... There, you know, Conan the Barbarian and like El, Elric and, and uh, Thomas Coven and all this was before him. But, but he was the first one to write a, uh, an anti-hero in this grimdark style. And if, this, if Heroes Die came out five years later... Matthew Stover is on everybody's lips right now. He probably has a TV show. Like, <laughs> Acts of Cain is one of the best-selling, you know, uh, fantasy series, sci-fi fantasy series of the 2000s. Like, he he just was too soon. But he understood this uh, sentiment that was growing in the fantasy and science fiction community before they kind of realized it themselves. You know, I've heard you say uh, a lot of the same thing uh, in this very podcast, too, about... Um, oh, no, it wasn't about another author. It was during Heroes Die, probably. What am I thinking? Yeah, no, it was, it was still Stover, actually. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> never mind. Uh, Pat, you're about to say something, man. Go ahead. Well, it's very apropos of Brandon Sanderson at oh, the sure. end of one yeah. of his books to wax about uh, how important artistic timing is. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, coming from a person who Sanderson's kind of catching everybody on the rebound in the sense that we've we've done our dalliance with yep. the anti-heroes mm-hmm. and now we might 
want something a little bit more along the traditional lines again. Listen, yeah. I've taken so, my lumps. I want that fantasy again. I want that field of roses of which I spoke mm-hmm. growing in between fields of manure, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, Wait, I mean, not that, not that Sanderson is a field of roses. No, I mean, he's got time. his own, yeah, he's got his yeah, own yeah. Uh, little bits and pieces here and there that, that can be a little exasperating. Uh, as well. But uh, getting back to Kane, I want to focus on what a piece of shit he was to start off. Um, <laughs> like, I have... <laughs> like, I I got... I have this quote here, right? From the from the very get-go. Um, Horse's mouth. I, I wrote down, of course, you can tell... You could probably tell that this was written down in the moment as I was reading the scene, but I wrote... Uh, so here's the scene. What the fuck is wrong with me? In some shit-rotten depth of my cesspit heart, I want the Ogreloy to trap us here. I want them to hunt us through the ruins, to catch and kill and eat these men and women with whom I have eaten and drunk and joked and slept, to catch and kill and eat even me. In this stark mirror, I finally recognize my face. Things just aren't ugly enough yet. I want this to get all the way worse, to go so dark that it erases the memory of day. And that's in the chapter called Maximum Bad. Yeah, like, which is, that is yeah. right, you, as soon as you dive into this book, you're getting this. It's like, I mean, okay, you, I, if you're used to Kane at this point, it's not really that that much of a surprise, but it's like, god damn, what a note to start this book off on. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that wins him an honorary spot in groups like the Forsaken, or the Tender <laughs> yeah. or the Nazgul, just, just on the merit of in, its... <laughs> malevolence it's and, and speaking of like starting the narrative off on like on this note i want to actually focus it for a second on the very first sentence of the book uh it literally starts off with hold on i have it written down here um the first line the dirt colored clouds spread wide hugging the horizon draining into the hollows of the distant hills you know as i've come to expect with the acts of cain our return is leaving us kind of feeling unclean if that's what i want to use after mm-hmm. what are literally the first four words of this book, the dirt colored clouds. I mean, yeah. it kind of just instantly says, like, yeah, it's basically like a welcome mat that says, welcome back to the shit, you know? Yep. Yeah, welcome back. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Welcome yeah. back. Fuck you. You know, have fun. Yeah. And, and so with, uh, kind of, kind of going back to like a, uh, a, a higher level look at this book and, and what it does, um, and how it differs from the previous books in the series, where Blade of Taishao was a uh, just relentless breaking down of everything that Cain is. Uh, this book is like a love letter from Stover to Cain. It's it's Cain unbridled. It's Cain <laughs> getting to do everything that Cain wants to do, and and. It, he has all the agency in this book, whereas in Blade of Taishal, he was constantly hindered and constantly restricted. And here we see him just running free and, I mean, absolutely... <laughs> it is. It was fun. Leaving was... carnage in his wake A at every time. turn in both narratives. And, and, and it's, again, kind of a commentary on what, what we are as consumers of this media, that it's so much freaking fun. Like yeah. seeing Kane in his element and cracking wise every you know every turn and and showing why he's so feared and respected and and why he became the star that he did and it's like like yeah it's entertaining but it also <laughs> makes you stop and consider yourself yeah. like you go back to his monologue on the sand of uh you know victory stadium at the end of heroes die when he when he says like i finally figured out who my enemy is it's you and he's talking to his audience but he's breaking the fourth wall too and he's talking to us as readers saying like you're the sick ones for indulging in this and and wanting so badly to immerse yourselves in this and like and obviously there's there's a line drawn there there there's a difference between reading a book about violence and and you know and and all this stuff and, you know, first-handing, as it were, putting yourself in virtual reality where you can literally feel the mm. adrenaline of killing somebody and, and their blood gushing out over your fingers and, and stuff like that. Like, that's yeah, another that's a level. Too yeah, much immersion. Okay. You, you just opened the gate to <laughs> what could be a very exhaustive topic. Oh, um, in, <laughs> open in that the, gate wide, motherfucker, let's do it. Bring it. <laughs> in, the, in the realm of fantasy. Now, okay. you yes. said... Uh, are the books we read um, 
are they about violence or do they contain yes. honestly violence? more and more i think they are actually a commentary on that violence yeah in this series i grant it's you but i mean i'm it. consider the genre as a whole mm-hmm. now just because there's violence in a series does not mean that the series is about violence of course no of course um so that that commentary on us as readers has to be taken with a grain of salt yes. when we consider that if we're reading the wheel of time there's plenty of violence in the wheel of time but it's it's the struggle between good and evil and the use of force in such a struggle is entirely justified and this is why i think uh, there's a lot of grim dark fantasy that i don't like mm. because it becomes about the oh violence. yes the, the, <coughs> Martin. the violence is <coughs> the Whoa. focus it yeah. is the purpose it is the shock value yeah. that that these you know, you know, things like I would argue Joe that... Abercrombie's First Law. Whereas, like, and even though the Axe of Cain is super gruesome and it's tough, I mm. mean, and, and, and Stover probably does go overboard at several points, like we talked about in our Blade of Tyshell episodes, but it's not about the violence. Yeah. He, he is trying to make a point with it that I think is lacking in a lot of other grimdark fantasy. I would say of all the books in this series, this one is the one that is most about the violence. Yes, I would say. I would agree with that. Um, Really? But further... further, More so than Blade of Tyshell? Well, I I suppose the violence was still treated as kind of auxiliary to the plot in that book. It was a lot lot bigger, had a lot more happening. I suppose with this book being as small as it is, you could argue the focus... Is that much more narrow? Yeah, I, you know, I might be actually and, persuaded to come around to that way of thinking now that. And uh, because I some half thought. of this book is retreat from the Bodeck. Yeah, exactly. Which, in in and of itself, is about the violence. Oh God, the it whole was hard. Point, there, there was no story to retreat from the Bodeck, and as we see very specifically laid out during that scene with Kohlberg and and uh, and Kane, where they talk about like. The viewers don't care about continuity. Yeah, like, they don't not, care this, about plot holes. They just want to see more carnage. And this is like, something that I want to discuss later because I have a problem with that. Actually, with actually with that exact scene about how they treated <laughs> the the you know the continuation of the plot at that point still didn't make much sense to me. It's uh, it's a cynical perspective, I think, because while he might be true in certain particulars, first of all, I don't like being uh, subjected to this. Hey, fuck you for reading my book. Yeah. kind of an attitude <laughs> well, well uh, okay, fuck you for making fine. me read your book dickhead that's how you know um, but uh, with with the other with other fantasy novels in mind the ones that are least about the violence are the ones where the violence is not directed at other humans the ones where it is most about the violence like game of thrones um Though, the most hardcore violence is human on human. The most mm. hardcore violence in Blade of Taishal is human on human. Yes. Um, that's where uh, this, this specter of bloodlust descends on, uh, on the reader. No. Mm-hmm. Because we, can, uh, we have ample justification in other works for cheering on the violence. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, you know, a horde of Trollocs is destroyed. Well, hooray for our heroes. That's yeah. yeah, and and you think about going back to the Rune Lords, which we you know just read a couple mm. of months ago. How at times it can be so frustrating having Gaborn being like almost pacifist. Like I can't use my powers to hurt people. Mm. He's like, he's like, I got, I got. It. It's all about protecting, and and it's that's a little bit of an you know a wake up call for the reader too. Like. Why, why do you have this compulsion toward violence? Well, it's expeditious, I suppose. <laughs> no. I, 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 there's sure. certainly no arguing with, <laughs> with two people fight and one of them dies. But the problem, yeah, yeah. good or evil, has been resolved. Like there is yeah, a, uh, yeah, yeah. It is decisive, I suppose. Yeah. I'd say I really appreciate the fact, though, that despite, you know, the fact that this, this book is a little more focused on the violence it's a little more focused on the language it, it, the humor really kind of counterbalances it you know stover really yes. gets a chance to flex his I, I really don't want to use this term but his funny muscles you know he uh <laughs> the, the the sheer amount of epic one-liners that we get mostly of course from kane just kind of balanced out every moment for every moment that i had a ugh, like a shiver i also had a <laughs> kind of moment you know yeah for for every 
paragraph that you have yeah. vivid descriptions of like Cain crucified by the black knives, you have twenty scenes of Cain cracking yeah. wise at Which, Knights of Krill. By the way, is like doing me no favors uh, at work when you know every forty five seconds I'm sitting there cracking up over my welds and I'm screwing up my welds and the guys are looking at me like, what is this guy's? <laughs> Problem. Like, what is he? I, I always have to see somebody looking at me. I just point to my headphones. Like, I'm just laughing about something I heard. You know, it's funny. I, I promise I'm not insane and hearing voices. Yeah, exactly. You know, I uh, am hearing voices, but I'm not insane. Yeah, yeah. Kane, you know, I, I've decided, I, I decided since we're, you know, still on Kane before we actually move on to maybe any other characters, I do want to point out the fact that I think I nailed, uh, I found the reason why it is I like Kane as much as I do, despite how much of a piece of shit he clearly is. Yeah. What I like about Kane. Uh, you know, is that if you if you subscribe to his particular brand of dark, kind of gritty, facetious humor, then he can literally make anything funny. Like even something as boring or mundane uh, as a walk through the supermarket would be hilarious if you're seeing through his eyes. And I don't think, and I'll add this, I don't think uh, Mile Koth really appreciates the caliber of the show that he's along on the ride for. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's a, a valid point. Um... It, it, and and to your point about like moving off of Kanan toward more characters, I don't even know if we need to do that in this episode because yeah, this like, book is so thoroughly like we could, just Kane. E exactly. We could explain, yeah. no, I like this character, what do you think of her, what do you think of him? But for the most part, this entire book is just a character study of, of this guy who gives us so many reasons to hate him and so many reasons to love him. Yeah, and no. so one of the things that I like... It, on, I should say, on my part, one of the reasons that I like Kane, despite the fact that I vehemently disagree with his brand of philosophy and his moral code, mm. is that he's at least self-aware <laughs> about it. He's there, There's a good line um, uh, late in the book where he's talking about Perth and Claylock and how uh, uh, Claylock um, challenged him, you know, above the, the cliff and... and uh, and it was because he was calling him names, basically. Yeah. Um, and I, I have it highlighted here. Yeah, that uh, was near the very, very end, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, I remember the story. So, so it was... Um... While Drew's finding that, oh, I just want to point well, out that... Uh, while you're looking... Discussing well, other characters is kind of um, difficult, because so many of the ones we talked about before are dead. So we can't... Yeah. We can't discuss where they're at now, as far as their development yeah. goes, because the well, arc of their destinies came to a sudden conclusion. Yes. While you're looking that up, Drew, uh, I, I just to, to support that exact same uh, point that you just made, I want to go back to the quote that I uh, read earlier from Kane's point of view near the very beginning of the retreat of the bo from the Bodecan, when he refers to his own shit rotten cesspit of a heart. I mean, you're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. He he is self aware of this kind of <laughs> very bleak outlook on life that he has. Yeah, so I have the quote here, and he Good. says, Here's the truth of Perth and Claylock. Under all his truth and honor and devotion to justice and noble reluctance to whatever, when you get to the bone, why exactly was he getting ready to kill me? For calling him bad names. Yeah. Yes, I am a bad man, but I've never been that bad. Perth and Claylock, the perfect knight, one more blood-drunk thug. And yeah, fine, blood-drunk thug should be carved on my own headstone. I don't claim to be better than him. But it does still chap my ass a little that everybody claims he's better than me. I have my own vanity. I don't kill for it. That's all. Yeah. Like, it, it's, there's definitely a self awareness there where he recognizes, like, look, I don't stand for truth and justice and all this stuff. Like, I, but I've long since kind of reconciled that with myself, which I don't necessarily agree with. And this, like, this is where his philosophy sharply diverges from my own. Like, if you have that self awareness, you don't just say, oh, well, that's who I am, and, yeah. and keep being a piece of shit. Oh, the shenanigans. Like, you should be working to make yourself better. Oh, but... Kane and your antics, you know. I, yeah. I see. Um, but, but he's at least self-aware, and that makes him more sympathetic for somebody, you know, a, a normal person like me. Sure. You yeah. know? Now, now, here's a question about that quote. Do you think Kane is correct about his interpretation of Claylock's character oh i do think he's correct because there's the other um there's another quote that i have highlighted i think he's oversimplifying was... it but maybe perhaps i don't know perhaps. so so when <clears throat> back at the very end of retreat from the bodecan when 
Perth and Claylock tells him to leave and gives him the horse. And Kane talks about, like, I thought you'd want to challenge me again. And he says, I was only an hour outside the camp when the studio pulled me. Two days later, before I even got out of the hospital, I finally realized why Claylock didn't re-challenge. He challenged me for calling him a coward. Get it? He was afraid he'd lose. Again. We can forgive any crime except the murder yes. of our illusions. I have no that line written down here. That's one of my one-liners that I have written down that I wanted to discuss. We can forgive any crime but the murder of our illusions. Or and, I'm and paraphrasing. that right there, I think, is the revealing character moment for Perth and Claylock. Sure, right? that, sure. That it, it, it vindicates Kane's opinion of him. Well, we're just getting Kane's take on it again like we're it getting Kane's take on it we're, but we're I mean this is Kane this is Kane's he, book though. I mean we know how Knights yeah. of Krill work and we know their their absolute conviction in these challenges and how if you lose in a challenge after accepting it, it's because Krill wanted you to lose yeah and he lost after accepting that challenge and he was afraid that he would lose again mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and that in and of itself revealed his own like inner uh inner issues to him, I'm yeah. very glad that we have a character, the current champion of Krill, juxtaposed yeah. to this uh, rat shit pretender. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Facetious. <laughs> That's, he's the definition of facetious. He yeah. treats nothing with any kind of gravity. Everything is just she, a flippant, go fuck yourself if you think I give a shit about that kind of remark. Yeah, she she kind of gives the lie to the, the, the illusions argument because she, she is... A, clearly a person of substance of, yeah. of virtue mm. so i'm just very glad that she's in the book and kane respects her yeah i mean ang Vas is one of my favorite characters she's in pretty this cool whole series she's pretty cool and you know we'll, we'll get more of her in kane's law as you'll see but oh good even just what her brief moments in this book i really like the way she handles things i like the way she handles kane yeah. Uh, the way she approaches him, and she kind of calls him out on his own shit, mm. unapologetically. She's like, "This is how it is," and and you can you can try to do your normal bullshit, but it's not going to work on me. I do appreciate the the manner in which uh, Stover approached his writing of Ongvas Claylock. You know, she's not a a a. a beautiful queen of battles she's not uh an immortal like she is i mean she's a a very you know she's a battle hardened warrior like she like he does blatantly i I, I didn't write down the exact description but uh you know you get this sense that she is not someone you want to fuck with at all despite (laughs) the fact that she holds this righteous Uh, position uh, as the champion of krill she you know a certain um you know uh measure of uh, decorum is is expected out of her, but I still I you could tell just through Kane's uh, in the manner in which Kane treats her, he kind yeah. of gets this sense as well. Like maybe perhaps this is one person with whom I don't want to fuck. Yeah. And and there's even more gravity lent to that, considering he so freely fucks with other everyone else. Krill, oh and, my god! And then even more so, he talks about like you know the Knights Venturer. Mm-hmm. That like we're talking about the ranks of the Knights of Krill and how he he pretty easily manhandled Turkild in yeah. the uh, you know in the the vigilry, and then he wrecked Perth and Clay like a knight captain mm-hmm. moments after seeing this guy like vaporize an Ogreloy's head with a Morning Star because he's just that strong and that fast with yeah. this like holy power that he wields, and then. Anvas is the champion, the champion. There's yeah. one of her. Like, and so when Kane is that willing to mess with guys who are just orders of magnitude faster and stronger and more badass than him, and then he's just he sees Anvas and he's like, Ooh, no. <laughs> Perhaps I'll tread a little lightly here. Go on, Pat. In, in essence, in essence, she is um, a paladin in any game that's been produced by Blizzard. <laughs> yeah. In other words, OP as fuck. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. Well, I mean, there technically wasn't a paladin in Diablo Three. It was named uh, Crusader, I think it was called. But 
I'm just uh, there, being, there was no, a but paladin I mean, that's in Diablo what... 2 and he rolled fucking hard. Yeah, the, yeah. That's what oh, I, had, I myself that's had what a fucking hammered in that was teleporting through and getting fucking doing key runs and shit. I know exactly what you're talking about. Wow. Yep. <laughs> I haven't thought about that game in 15 years or so. Holy shit. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah, but, but, and Matthew Stover, too. Thank fuck you. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's kind of a good point to make, like, because the Knights of Krill are paladins. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. as we see in many other, you know, uh, series and, and things where a paladins stone are with present, divine paladins right. are not incorruptible. But it, just because you're a paladin doesn't mean you're automatically a good person. Yeah. And so we see that with the Knights of Krill, but we yeah. also do see actually good people, specifically uh, Angvos Claylock in, uh, yeah. in, in those uh, ranks. On an amusing uh, somewhat side note, speaking of paladins, incorruptibility, and things that would totally fit within the, the world of Cain, hmm. the paladins of Diablo 2, originally one of their design features was that they would eat the hearts of their fallen enemies to regain health and mana. Mm-hmm. But they decided to take that out as it would be a little gruesome. But yeah. I could totally see something similar occurring in this For universe. Sure. I, I mean, the Knights of Krill already have like blood rites and mm-hmm. things, and... and uh, um... But but staying on the subject of Knights of Krill, and this is just kind of an aside. Um, I, I don't have much of a point other than to talk about the writing here. And because we haven't talked too much about how great a, a wordsmith Stover really is. Oh, yes. Um, he has several, several points in this book that his writing just blew me away. But uh, there's one scene when Cain wakes up after being healed from Turkhild's beating. And uh, uh, Markham, Lord Tarkanon, is sitting, waiting for him to wake up. And the line describing him is, it's so simple, but it is so effective, and it gives you a, a perfect image. And it is, seated in a severe chair by a severe window was a severe man in severe armor. <laughs> and I love that line. I did like that line, too. I definitely did. It was oh. awesome. It was, it was like, pretty it, good. It, it just gives you such an impression of what the Knights of Krill are and their sensibilities, their aesthetic, and then Markham's own appearance and own personality all in one very simple way. How, how fucked up is this to consider? Because, you know, you, you t- let's take a step back and look at that, just that quote that you gave there, Drew, uh, objectively. You have this word repeated so many times. I can guarantee you that if somebody, if I was like in, I don't know, if I could go back to like sixth or seventh grade, back to like, you know, the beginnings of, hey, write a little story for English class and hand it in. If I had used mm-hmm. that phrase to describe someone, my English teacher back then would have been like, what the fuck are you doing? This is redundant, you idiot. That's, yeah. you know, yeah. C minus. You're right, but yeah, exactly. when, when you know what you're talking about and you and you have all of this context with which yeah. to read this this statement, you really get to appreciate, as Drew says, that the the caliber of a wordsmith that Stover continues to show mm-hmm. himself to be. Absolutely, he does show he does show himself to be sophisticated because the in writing as with any art, the the best method is to learn the established way things are done. And then if you decide you're going to break the rules, then you are able to, and that makes you sophisticated. Yes. Whereas if you don't know the rules and you break them by accident, you're just a barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> this is something that uh, Patrick Rothfuss actually described very briefly about the character of Denna in the King Killer mm. Chronicle, mm. where he actually, it's written from, of course, from Quoth's point of view, and this is not a spoiler for the plot, so don't worry if you haven't read King Killer Chronicle. It's just the the manner in which the character of Denna was described at one point. She and her musical talent, the fact that Kvoth found her musical talent so alluring because she doesn't know the rules. And he described her as somebody who would, you know, simply walk through a wall because she's not supposed she doesn't know that a door is supposed to be there. Right? So you mm-hmm. you have you know a Stover on one hand who is doing exactly what pat describes he knows the rules he's breaking them on purpose and he's making a statement about that i think and then you have authors like rothfuss who seem to you know write their characters waxing rhapsodic about you know the exact opposite yeah. break you know yeah so speaking of characters i can't stand <laughs> well, we'll, we'll get to that you know way down the road we'll yeah that's, oh way anyway, down uh, the road uh, but I, I do want to kind of uh, talk a little bit more about Cain and specifically yes. something that we haven't talked about yet throughout all of the acts of Cain so far, and that is, is he a reliable narrator? And uh, and he's mostly uh, portrayed as a reliable narrator in these books, 
But there were a couple of things on this read through, and this is the third time now that I've read Kane Black Knife, uh, that I picked up on. And one of them was early on, and he's talking about uh, Delian. And he says, a couple of years ago, a friend of mine wrote a book that was supposed to be the story of his lives, or story of his life, you pick. Anyway, <laughs> he wrote that what your life means depends on how you tell the story. And that, he uses that in context to kind of justify his own... Yeah, you think like, it's a bit of a red flag action. there, perhaps? It, it is, because if you go back to Blade of Taishao, which is this book that Delian wrote, mm -hmm. that idea came from Cain in the first place. Okay, yeah, Cain yeah. Cain was the one who convinced Delian to, to keep going by telling him, like, you write your own story. And now he's then using Delian as an authority to justify his own actions. But he's just using his own philosophy. Like, he could still be plenty wrong. Does and then King there's another... strike you as somebody who really needs justification? Even personal justification yes, for his, he, act, yes. for his he actions? He really own? doesn't want to admit that he does, but yes, he does. Okay, okay. It's, it's human. It's human to um, seek to justify when, when conscience comes... Uh... Comes a knocking. He's like a he's yeah. like our truly dickhead light song. He says, "You cannot trust huh. me. You cannot trust me. Don't depend on me. I will fail you." But he's in, <laughs> the way he approaches it is a lot more uh, colorful, if that's the word, <laughs> the word I want to use. Yeah. So this other quote that I I don't really buy Kane's uh, 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 assertion here. He says, "I came to Overworld, became an actor in the first place." To taste the kind of power I could never have on Earth. Sure, wealth. Sure, fame. Adulation. And even some political influence. But all that was just perks, you know? The real prize was power. To ignore the laws that circumscribe the lives of Earth's undercasts. To live without law altogether. To bow to no law except my own will. But that's more abstract than it really was. When you get right to the bone, it was about being a god. To kill without consequence. And I do not at all buy that. That is eye-opening a little bit, I think. I, I absolutely do not buy that that was his motivation. You don't? Everything we've read from him before so this you, says so what that you is think not that, his motivation. So you think that he's actually being more cynical about himself than, than he necessarily needs to be? Yes. I think he's, he's, uh, he's trying to present himself as like a deeper and at the same time more base uh, person than he is. Because we know, like we, we've seen through three books, including in this book... He did care about the fame. He was in it for the adulation. He was in it for the audience. That was why he became an actor. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to be a star. It wasn't because he wanted to kill indiscriminately. You see, I, it wasn't I got, because he wanted to be a god. Like I got the sense like, though that he was that he was now that he's older, he's able to look back at his motives and think maybe I was lying to myself back then, and perhaps you know the older middle aged Harry Michelson is actually you know, the one who is starting to realize that maybe his past self was, was lot, was the unreliable narrator. Mm, I, I don't get that impression because no? he was still, he still acted like that in heroes die when he was going out of his way to not kill people. Well, speaking of his past self, um, I do want to discuss who he was when he started this whole journey of, of who he was going to become. Um, uh, mm -hmm. like it's it's really fascinating to see a, a young Kane in his prime. I mean, we we already seen a young Kane, of course, at the beginning of Plate of Tai Shall. But we now in 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 this book, what we see um, during the then timeline is we see uh, how old was he then? Twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven. He was twenty five. Yeah, he's, like he was in his mid twenties at that point, and he's starting to really learn what it means to take lives. Like for example, um, this is a scene I wanted to discuss uh, in particular: the death of Stalton. It was mm. it was a Oof. hard it was hard to read, um, not for the content that you know at this point we're used to, but for what it does to the man that we've seen up until now treating death and gore and pain like old friends that he just can't seem to get rid of you know, um, mm -hmm. and I have a quote here from that exact scene um, as he was you know having unfortunately to deal that fatal blow to Stalton to just you know kind of save him from this pain of this gruesome death he said. I've killed men before, but I've never killed a man who's real to me, he, like, who's a person, a guy I like, mm. a <laughs> man I wish could have been my friend. And I want to focus on the fact that he said, I've never killed a man who's real to me. 
So what are we supposed to glean from this? That everybody he's seen before, that he's killed, of course, he's killed men before, just isn't real to him? He doesn't consider, you know, on equal standing? Yeah, he, he saw them as less than human. Yeah, and now that he's in the shit, literally and figuratively, I suppose, he's starting to realize that everybody he kills could have a story like Stalton, I think. You mm -hmm. know, everybody, like, there is no... <laughs> there is no uh, just faceless evil that all of his choices are a consequence and they are directly affecting other people. Um, so yeah, I, and, I, and I thought it was really interesting to see the beginning of that journey. And I don't I don't have the line here, but it continues after that when he's talking to Rabobal as Rabobal is having his like last yeah. stand and he's going to commit suicide. And, and King thinks to himself, at least I don't have to kill him, too. And he <laughs> thinks like. Will it ever get any easier killing somebody that I like? And then wonders, am I horrible for mm. hoping that it will get easier? Because yeah. I anticipate having to kill more people that I like. But we reach this kind of really depressing point in his character arc by the end of it. Where if that's the case, where he's like getting a, sort of a self-awareness with killing throughout Retreat from the Bodeccan, where he's, he's recognizing the ramifications of taking lives, it ends with him still throwing firebombs into the Ogreloy Cubs' pens and yeah. absolutely exterminating the entire Black Knife Nation. That and, was hard to read. Oh. And, and and you have Tazar, and, and she saw it. She was furious with him. Well, it was... she knew. It was Mirage. She knew. Wasn't it that, that was he more went, pissed off at him than... Hold on. No, oh, it doesn't matter. Sorry, go ahead. Maraid was in... She was still uh, uh, chained up in the Overwatch oh, camp when he started throwing fuck. the firebombs. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's... It's kind of a... You know, we reached a full character arc with Kane in Retreat from the Bodecan, but it didn't necessarily end up in a good place. Oh, that, that it didn't. <laughs> that it didn't. So... I don't know. But... Um, I... Go I ahead. do have like a couple more things that I want to talk about. Oh um, yeah, that before are, we get to our like favorite sort of. Yeah, um, the uh, continued use of real world literary references. Oh yeah, this uh, is, we got I a lot a of like Heinlein in the first two books, and then in this one, uh, Jonathan Fist. He he uses Jonathan Fist as his pseudonym, and he repeatedly mentions like Jonathan Fist also made a deal. And then at the end, uh, when he's talking to Simon Fowler to rob a ball in the Buchanan, you know, social correction institute or whatever it's called, he says Jonathan Fist, uh, and and rob a ball is like, uh, I don't, I don't know. And he's like, oh, it's originally German, and he's like, what? And Kane scoffs and says, man, nobody reads these days. Yeah. What he's referring to is Faust. The okay. the classic. Okay. Uh, like Faust's deal with like uh, Mephistopheles and and his flawed deal with the devil essentially, and and that's what this literary reference is. And then there are more references. There's there's more um, a Heart of Darkness in this book. There was a little bit of it in Blade of Tychal. Um, again, talking about like Kurtz and and like how he went insane and and how the jungle is within all of us. Uh, but I I liked that a lot. I yeah. I like that he. Stover's capable of writing a book that is a rollicking action adventure packed with comedy and, and you know, all of that. And at the same time, he can retain, like, high concept, um, uh, like, narrative devices and tie in, like, you know, classic literature. Yeah. Into it as well. Like, it's, yeah. it's really impressive what he does with the writing of these yeah. books. I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing when I, uh, when I, I say read, when I heard that line that you're referring to, Drew, uh, when Kane just makes that offhand comment, like, nobody fucking reads anything anymore. I was, uh, <laughs> I was at work and I was, I was, I had the plier, the welding pliers in my hand and I was fixing a, a wire that had gotten stuck in, in, in my little gun and the boss was walking by. And I remember hearing that line and thinking, oh, uh, Kane is saying nobody reads anymore. This is probably another reference to something. I should check it out. But I couldn't pull up my cell phone at that point. And of course, I forgot all about it until now. You're just bringing that up. But I did pick up on that line. There and there are there is a point that I wanted to make about the uh, the references that Stover makes to you know 20th century 
uh, literature in this book. And my point was mm -hmm. this. Why are the only writers ever quoted in sci-fi timelines from the 20th century? You know, is in, in, in for example, the Acts of Cain is not such a big plot hole because you're dealing with the year, I think it's like 2190 um, at, in this case. But it still seems to be a thing, and in, in, in I'm making an observation now about sci-fi in general. Uh, you know, in novels, okay, take the Halo novels, for example, or uh, the Illuminae Files, to mention a couple. You know, series that take place supposedly centuries in the future. The only quotes that we get are either quotes from their present or from the 20th century. There's, there's, there doesn't appear to have been any notable people throughout the 21st or the 22nd or the 23rd maybe, century. Maybe the authors so, don't have the hubris to invent classics like, I get of their that own. Writers in our you, time sometimes guys, want to quote. You two totally should. You know, other uh, real I, individuals I or events, but you know, you have a point here, Rob. But I don't think it's valid for the Acts of Cain because sure, he yeah, that, that does yeah. invent some stories and books in the intervening time. Well, that's, we just gloss over them. That's exactly what I was actually getting to here. They don't mean anything to us. I said sometimes, you know, uh, I get that writers in our time sometimes want to quote, you know, other real individuals or events, but at least balance those out with quotes that you can invent for the interim. You know, we're not mm -hmm. stupid. We'd still we'd realize that those are still coming from you. So, I don't know. It was just a stupid little nitpick. But and again, I like I said at the top of this particular point, I, with the Acts of Cain, it's only twenty one ninety. It's not centuries into the future. It's not that far along. Andrew, you, you mean I, you're right. Uh, yeah, that was just a little observation yeah, there, that, I, that I made. Yeah, um, but but it, it is certainly a, a thing in a lot of other science fiction. Yeah, a, very a writer right from that. the 20th um, century said this, and then a writer from the yeah. 20th century said that. It's like okay, so <laughs> what about the meantime? You know, I don't know. It was just a little. I, I just did. I don't know. Just a little nitpick yeah. that I had. Once we read the gap, that oh, nitpick yeah. will be solved for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. The ancillary documentations. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Good. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, do we want to move into our like favorite one-liners? Fuck and yeah, let's do that. I have a lot of these written because down. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I really want to just drive this home. This book is hilarious. Oh, it's good. I mean, it is so funny. It might this be the funniest with, fucking book I've ever read. Yeah, like, this is absolutely up there with, like, Scott Lynch and, you know... Uh, oh, uh, Lies of Locke Lamora was pretty good, though, yeah. That's yeah, true. But, but I mean... I mean, that's my standard for, for funny fantasy is, is the Lies of Locke Lamora and maybe Republic <laughs> of Thieves, too. As far as just, like, one-liners go, this is right there with them. I, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I actually think I like Kane, uh, Stover's humor a little more than Lynch's, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Yeah, so, Rob, kick us off. All right. So, I mean, the one-liners that I have written down, of course, I mean, I have a few of them, but I've also picked my top three. Um so I'll, I'll list my top my top three favorite ones, and then we'll just keep continuing with ones that we really like, I suppose. Honorable mentions, yeah, if you will. I have a few honorable mentions. All right. So <laughs> uh, my, my third place one, uh, it, it's an observation about the caliber of Kane's character. Because at one point, uh, Tehran <laughs> asks him, do you have any idea how hard it is to kill a knight of Krill? And Kane just kind of looks at him. <laughs> yes. And I literally yes. laughed out loud while I was working. And I may or may not have screwed up a three-inch weld because of this one. Uh, Kane can turn <laughs> even total silence into an epic one-liner. But then, yep. of course, we get a bit more context for this later, which kind of makes it <laughs> no longer funny at all. Because you yeah, find yeah. out, you know, uh, yeah, that Kane has seen Murad's final cube. That's, you know, her final moments as she was ended by Baron. Yes. By the way, epic point about this i want to make later too but that was my third place one uh second place uh i would i will say is one with, that we got right at the very beginning when Ooh. uh you know the the ogreloy the black knives are well the black knife clan i should say is on its way to completely fuck their shit up and then kane oh. says to everybody else in the party he says aren't you hearing her let me translate we could rape their wives, kill their grandmothers, eat their babies. We could ass bone their goddamn lap dogs, and nothing they do to us would be any worse than it's gonna be anyway. Understand? This shit's lip deep, and the tide is coming in. <laughs> and I thought okay, that was okay. So go, go ahead. You actually, I thought you were gonna steal one of mine there, and you you did a different one from like the same scene. Yeah. But. Yeah, so what, what was your number one, then? Uh, my number one <laughs> was, was a very simple one-liner. It was uh, while he and Murad um, were, they were, they were naked, they were in each other's arms, and mm -hmm. he says, he makes this, this observation to himself, he goes, better roll over. If she touches my dick by accident, she'll think I pulled a knife. 
That was my favorite. Fuck that. That may be the funniest goddamn fi- like single phrase I've ever fucking read in a book ever. That was, I fucking la- I was in tears at work laughing my oh, ass man. off over the quality of that line. Those those gold. Those fucking gold. So yeah, those are my top oh. three. Okay. Well, so my my top three. Uh, my my number three is uh, that ending scene where the social police have. Uh, Kane, you know, wrapped up, and they're trying to walk him off, and mm-hmm. and Kane does his uh, his manipulation and gets Perth and Claylock to to you know try to stop them. Yeah, and this is legality is moot. One of the soapies said, "Administrator Michelson is our prisoner now." No, <laughs> if the stone tablets <laughs> on which God carved the Ten Commandments could talk, they would have sounded a lot like Claylock's voice did then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's, I love how Stover writes Claylock so much. Oh, it was great. Yeah. What, what are your yeah. next ones? Let's hear them. So my uh, my next one, I gotta I gotta pull it up. It's it's a long it's a long section, but I find it so hilarious. And and like maybe maybe this just tells you like how much I drink, but <laughs> it's when when he's uh, drinking with Turkild and Krav McRedhorn and. Uh, He's like slowly coming to the realization that he like independently discovered scotch. <laughs> oh yes, I fucking pumped my arm in the air. Yeah, and he's like, wait, stop, both of you. Hot staggering fuck. Grillswill is distilled beer. <laughs> Give me that. <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> for those for those who have listened to a few like if anybody's listened to all of our past episodes you probably recall me hearing or me saying before i should say i love scotch i am a scotch well whiskey drink i'm drinking whiskey right the fuck now yeah, i yeah. love my whiskey i love my scotch so when i when i literally heard kane come to the realization that he was actually getting ahead of the curve and market and, and, and being able to fucking patent that kind of scotch i was like oh yeah. Yes. He's like Kane's like all prepared to like ship up Tanar and Brandy barrels yep. and get like a whole why don't like, you, operation. Why don't going. you leave it why don't you leave it in the barrel for a year? And they look at him like, what the <laughs> fuck are you saying? Yeah. Oh, that was great. That that kind of um, dramatic irony was gold. Yeah, and so my, my number one is actually right at the beginning of the book. You you quoted that opening, the dirt colored cloud spreads wide, like that that line. Two paragraphs oh, later. Oh, oh, can I guess? Just uh, the subject, at least? Was the subject, yep. uh, fucking, uh, was the subject Sunsa? Yep. Yeah. So it says, I could quote Sun Tzu at her. Dust <laughs> high and sharp will be chariots. Dust low and wide is infantry. But instead I shrug and hand her them monocular. If Sun Tzu had ever seen infantry like this, he would have crapped his silk so fucking, fucking pajamas. <laughs> yes! And I, I have actually a point. <laughs> About that line specifically, <laughs> believe it or not, as you know, just basically where it is in the in the book, the fact that we uh, that Stover manages to set the tone so well with that line because that was I think just two or three paragraphs in that was on the first yeah, yeah. page, depending on if you're you know listening or reading on the audiobook or reading the physical or reading the electronic, I should say. But yeah, that was I think, and I want to give that specific line a shout out for how well it set the tone for this book. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, Pat, do you have a, a top three? I do yeah. not. Okay. That's fair. That's Actually, fair. Because I am not as much of a fan of the humor. Interesting. As you really? guys are. Um, really? Interesting. Now, I did like the line about the the stone tablets. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was good. That was basically the only standout <laughs> one for me. But my issue with it is that it's all kind of samey. It's, it's uh, like a, could, he's a one-trick pony. That. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, sure. it is. And and while sure. like Scott Lynch kind of suffers from the same uh, problem, uh, I think <laughs> the tone is a little bit lighter in Scott Lynch, and so it works a little more for me. Hmm. So yeah, this is the exact uh, problem that I have with some of Brandon Sanderson's characters, like yeah. Lyft, uh, yeah, like yeah, w- yeah. like Wayne, uh, Cody from yeah. the Reckoners. You know, they they seem to it's a it's they're a one-trick pony. It's the same joke yes. again and again and again and again, again and again and again. The difference between Kane and Sanderson is Sanderson is it's an obvi- it's obviously a joke and he's obviously trying to be funny. I don't think Kane is necessarily trying to be funny when he says these things. He just says them because that's what he's feeling. Oh, and but- if we happen to find it funny, well, yes, 
right there, you, know, you just said, good, though. Good for us. You, right there, though, you were comparing Sanderson to Kane, though, not Sanderson to Stover. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that tells you how much, how strong a voice Kane has. Yeah. But it's, it, Pat's 100% right on this. There's actually a line in this book. I don't, I don't have the exact quote, but Kane basically says, like, I am not particularly noted for my sense of humor. Hmm. And then I, that does, line yeah. in and of itself like made me laugh because I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? You make yeah. me laugh all the time. Yeah, but, um, yeah. But I do have a couple like honorable mention oh, lines fuck, that I have aren't a bunch necessarily too. funny, Hell yeah. but are just like the like, were impact lines. Uh, one of them was right after Kane like set off the flaming giant arrow on the cliff above Hell, pointing right to him, and he does the shout, the magical shout, and he just says, "You were." warned like <laughs> screaming yeah. this at the at the black knives like that was such a just ooh. yeah like man like to see that on on screen like that'd be incredible and then the other one and and this is in my opinion th- like this may be one of one of if not the most hardcore impact lines in this whole series is during kane's conversation with kirindal and uh and, and he's he's trying to to uh to convince her to to not be antagonistic and she says why is this so important to you i shrug oh yes or exactly my brother the black knives are my clan oh please since when i was adopted you were the most pretentious self-aggrandizing excuse for a i'm serious about this here remember what happens to people who hurt my family and she goes your adopted ogrillo family here what faith is adopted uh, yeah i went oh that line. shit and, and it's, when i read he that, describes like, like this whole time she's laughing you know in, in her in her like whisper and it's always described as like a river of glass bells and glass tinkling and stuff and after he says faith is adopted the next line is the river of bells flash froze in midair yeah it's That's... just like because you know in that moment you get exactly what it is Kane is saying he's saying faith was adopted and still he doesn't even have to explain himself again that's this is one of these talents i think that Kane has as a well stover expresses through Kane as a character the ability to say everything with nothing yeah definitely it's it's a testament to his talent as a writer yeah like Absolutely. Sometimes he, silence he can is raise the, best the hairs on your arms with with one innocuous line. Faith is, is adopted, a, this and is you're just like, example. "Holy shit!" I totally agreed with that. Yeah. Um, there was a moment where something uh, <laughs> there. And I, I, I again, this was a moment when like the boss was walking by the plant. The, the, sorry, I should say the floor manager is walking by. So I was like, "Shit, I can't pull this out and write this down." But there was a moment where something incredibly terrible, or uh, it was gruesome, or it was cruel in some way. It was explained to Cain. Um, it, it was hilarious because in that, in this moment, we're expecting like a big outburst from Kane or a condemnation or something in, in uh, the way of any sincere reaction, but he just goes, that's fucked. And I just, I, I just <laughs> that juxtaposition there was just something that, I, again, something that I think it's just, I suppose it's an observation about humor as a whole that I've made. When you set up an expectation like that and then you flip it so hard on its head, it's just funny. It's yeah. funny as hell. Uh, there's so many funny one-liners in this book. Like I said before, this is the funniest book I think I've ever read. Uh, the Lies of Locke Lamora had me laughing quite a bit too. Uh, but I still think this one this one takes the cake. Like, for example, uh, a, a point when <laughs> Kane said, the champion of Krill wants to apologize, and he equates it to something along the lines of, it was like yeah. being offered a hand job from the Pope. And I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> fuck! I didn't even know it was possible to say something like that. God damn. So uh, it, it's oh, funny. What, one of my other uh, uh, honorable mentions is like just after that, where he's he's talking to her and he's negotiating. He's like, I want authority. I want the Krill's blessing. And he says, your authority comes straight from Krill, right? That's what I want. I want freedom of action. Oh. Next time some asswipe Turkild takes a swing at me, I want to flip out the holy foreskin. And yes, the to holy foreskin. I'm working for God's own motherfucking <laughs> self. <laughs> and then how many references we get in the future of him whipping out that holy foreskin. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Kate, we saw that holy foreskin so many times. I wonder what my family's thinking right now upstairs listening to me say the words holy foreskin over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make them read this book and be oh, like, there God. you go. But uh, what yeah. What kind of oh, books man, are still... you reading, young man? 
Yeah. I mean, th- 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 there were also a few callbacks that I really appreciated. You know, for example, there's fighting and there's fighting. I loved that. The, yes. the fact that we saw that oh. again and again after, you know, going without it for long enough. I, I just, you know, I thought it was an interesting stylistic and choice. And I think that uh, Stover, uh, you know, he really hit the right note on that one. Um, but yeah, uh, let's keep talking about yeah, one. these one-liners. Yeah, go ahead. I have another one. Kind of on the same note as the there's fighting and there's fighting. Yeah. And it's it's when he's like back in the Bodekin after being recalled and he's using the knife to scrape off the healing mud and each time the knife uh, like touches a scar he records what it is mm. and he says there are scars the blade cannot touch but I don't need them the ones on the outside are enough to tell me who I am fuck like that's oh man that hits home fuck it's God. home I don't remember that line at all to be honest with you shit that was deep I mean, <laughs> I mean, pun intended, I guess. I didn't mean to do that, but um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I have, of course, the one written down that you mentioned earlier. We can forgive any crime but the murder of our illusions. Uh, let's see here. Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 yes. Uh, one of the moments with Murad in the same scene that I that I mentioned as my favorite, you know, one liner in the whole book when he says better roll over. If she touches my dick, she'll think I pulled a knife in that <laughs> same scene just before that. Um, again, they're they're naked in each other's arms. It's it's perhaps leading somewhere. You know, it is a fantasy adventure after all. And he goes, yep. hey, I've got an idea for a good time. Why don't I bleed to death on your lap while you outline my defects of character? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that one. I appreciated that one so much. It was great. You know, I, I, there's a moment where he goes, "I'd say I was sorry if you know I was." I was. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good way to say that. Ah, oh, this I get. This book yeah. is just. It, I get. It's a lot like sifting for gold. I suppose it's a very adequate metaphor. You know, you're sitting there shifting back and forth, and just again, nug, 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 nug. It's 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 so. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I also liked the one like where he's talking about this giant like fresco done of uh, Perth and Claylock's like heroic stand at, at oh uh, yes know, on the Bodecan and and he's talking about it, and he's like I do not by the way appear in that painting yeah <laughs> speaking exactly of this scene as if he needs to say it um, as if he needs in this scene um in case we were going to actually explain oh, our our God. three favorite scenes on top of our three favorite one liners I actually wrote down oh. that one that was fucking awesome claylock's yeah. last stand against the Ogriloy, and like it was so badass after he launched him from that that kind of, i forget where he was but it's from a very high point like he just fell we i thought he fell to yeah. his death but then he gets that moment a couple minutes later when he looks <laughs> over and he sees claylock just in the river just fighting just bam 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 he's just knocking Ogriloy off of him like flies i was like i got chills like that was awesome was, yeah was i mean probably my thing. favorite scene and this was like a like a double whammy of like a great line and a badass scene is when he actually kills Perth and Claylock mm. and his hands are like strip cuffed and he goes through this description of how like so social police strip cuffs are like impossible to break out. Like you can take a blowtorch to him or a buzz yeah. saw and it's not going to work. <laughs> and he's like basically anything that doesn't send out the coded electronic pulse that triggers the doohickey to rearrange the cuffs long chain molecules is pretty much useless. They are not, however, designed to bind the wrists of a guy whose right hand can suddenly become roughly as hot as the surface of the sun. See, that's the that's <laughs> point, actually. It, it, tell me, this is something I want to get your opinion on. Perhaps this is just the pretentious fucking uh, science nerd coming out inside of me here, but the surface mm-hmm. of the sun is still not that fucking hot. It's about 5,000 degrees Celsius. It's about double the temperature of liquid steel. It's, I mean, the, the the core of the sun is like 40 million degrees. That's a whole other thing. But the surface of the sun, he, he, he I don't know. It just seemed like in that, in that moment, I thought that was like a, meh, I don't know. Was that me being just a pretentious fucking. Uh, forgivable I mean, hyperbole in my book. Yeah, yeah I maybe mean, a bit of Kane's hyperbole. Okay, exactly I'll grant you like that. A, like an astrophysicist or something. Uh, and well, and then again, if you think, <laughs> let's, if we really want to dive into the technicality, but this the social weird. police would not have designed handcuffs that would um, be removed if you apply 5,000 degrees to them. Sure, they, they, they probably saw like... to apply 5,000 degrees to their hands to free them because then you'll <laughs> lose your hands anyway. They probably saw that like, more. oh, 3,000 degrees, we're good, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's probably it, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think we should, uh, I mean, if we have any like final thoughts, I know I have a, just a couple very small things. Yeah, same here. A couple final draft. just very small things. Actually, I think we've gone... Th- oh, okay, so yeah. I mentioned uh, Baron really briefly earlier. Um, I just, I'm just i just saying mm-hmm. that I, I wanted to stop for right now and just make an observation that I want Baron back. 
because after learning what hmm. happened to Murad and Tazar, I want him oh. back just so I can watch him die again. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And my last, my very, very last thought is um, <clears throat> I actually learned another new word. And I think this is going to be something that I highlight every time it happens, just, you know, for others who might be learning new words here and there as well. I learned a new word in this volume. That is apostasy. A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like... It's, like yeah, heresy, it's the but, yeah. abandonment or, or renunciation of a religious or political belief. Mm -hmm. So just, yeah, have a little bit played, of that. Every time from now on um, I learn a new word, I'm going to actually draw attention to it. Have you played uh, uh, Dragon Age? No, but my brother rants about that game. Apparently it's awesome. Oh, and it's, Danielle yeah, does good. quite but, a bit too. But there's like kind of a religion built around like mages and, and Templar and stuff. And some yeah. mages who who like flee the... The order of the Templar and and their rule are apostates. Mm, and that's gotcha. apostasy is the, yeah. Um. But yeah. So I I only have a, a couple of short things. One of them is there's a line that he talks about horses very early at the beginning of this book. Horses. And he says I don't even like horses all that much. Horses in general. All I can say for horses in general is they're a hell of a lot better than people in general. <laughs> now. This is a random throwaway line, but then there's more random throwaway lines in the middle of this book where they talk about somebody, it's when Tapas is talking with Cain okay. about her like record of, of him. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like that didn't happen that way. Like I used the blade wand to cut the tear punch, so mm. not some reverse color Kosal. She talks about somebody called the horse witch. Several times. And he's like, how could you possibly... I what, don't like, recall what? this. Yeah. Uh, recall it. And keep that in your mind. Oh, yeah, King's no. Law. Okay. Oh. For King's Because law. this is something that we, we are going to need to discuss. The Horse when Witch? We, w the Horse Witch. Oh, that sounds like a horror movie. That sounds like something creepy. Ew. No. Um, that sounds like some Blair Witch. Get it away. No. <laughs> <laughs> like, but keep that in mind. Because they're... they're this is going back to my point at the top of the episode where I said, like, there are weird things going on with time in this episode that I'm like... Yeah, Kosal, what the I, fuck is happening I with that? It's books. suddenly centuries old and it's there on in the hand and it's like... Yes. I was so fucking confused during that. Yes. Sorry, that's another point that I forgot to bring up. There were points in this book I was so fucking lost. The conversation with Kirindal, yeah. I was fucking lost. And the and Kosal appearing on the, mm -hmm. the in, in the hand of, of, of Krill, is yeah. what they're calling it. Yeah. Uh, what the heck? Uh, so you're telling me this is explained in Kane's Law? Kind of. If uh -oh. you can get Just your head around of? it. So I, I've read the first three books in the series three times, okay. and Kane's Law twice. I'm pretty sure I understand all of it. <laughs> oh, okay, so it's not... Okay, the, I thought this, you meant like it would just do... It hints. is no joke when he has chapters named Raining Weird in the fourth book. Like... Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but, so that's just something okay. to keep in mind. Like, okay, keep cool, cool. The, the horse witch and, and horses and things. Oh, man, it's still, every time you say that, I get the shivers. Um, the heebie -jeebies. But my last point, uh, which I think is, is kind of a good segue into our, our uh, conclusion here and, and all that, there's a reference in the middle of this book that I just caught for the first time. Oh? And he's talking to uh, Kohlberg, and he says, when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, I met Nathan Mast. You know who he was? And through context, we find out Nathan Mast was a famous actor, like, back in the day. He was uh, Jonathan McKemby's sidekick. Like, he was he was a big deal actor. I don't know any of these names. So, you, you don't really need to. They're, they're like Raymond Story and Jonathan McKemby are like the, the original superstar actors. From oh, Avengers in, in Stover's Day. universe. I thought you were talking yeah. about actors that we have no, 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 on our... No. Oh, okay, sorry. That's where my... Yeah, okay, you're good. I got you. And so he says, when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, I met Nathan Mast. Okay. Now, there is a very hard to get your hands on Stover Kane short story called In the Sorrows. Oh? That is about this. Oh. And this is something that I think we should read. It, not not immediately, okay. but I think sure, we should sure. read it at some point down the line and have a podcast episode on. And that brings me to my next big point, our announcement. Uh -huh, yes. We are setting up a Patreon. Yeah, uh, we are. 
by the time you guys listen to this episode, uh, it will have been live for a while now, but mm -hmm. we, we are setting up a Patreon and one of our uh, donation levels is going to give you access to uh, short story, short episodes that Rob and I do together. Yeah, They're going to be probably 20, 30 minutes long, much, much more uh, consumable than our monster hour plus regular episodes. <laughs> but... I think we should very much do In the Sorrows for one of these Okay, episodes. yeah, add it to the list. I mean, if it's if it's Stover, I'm down. If it has anything to do with Kane, I'm down. Yeah. Yeah, for so, sure. Uh, so, yeah. Do we want to head on into the final draft then? Hell or yeah. Do you, or do you have something else to say there? No, um, I'm pretty much done with everything I needed to say. Um, we could head into Sweet. the final draft. I could even kick us off because I've got, I'd say that probably, probably the least exciting uh, of our choices <laughs> today. Um, I mentioned earlier the... I was drinking whiskey. Um, what I'm drinking right now is Alberta Premium. I decided to forego beer this week because beer just makes me have to go to the bathroom again and again and again. It's I can't. I just <laughs> can't. Oh, so dude. I decided to stop. I decided to stop at the uh, the local liquor store and I just got some Alberta Premium Canadian Rye Whiskey. Uh, this is something I've been drinking for a couple years. It goes down smooth. I just drink it, of course, with a splash of water. Neat, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know. I'd recommend it. This is this is a very safe whiskey to fall back on. <laughs> well, you know, Rob, for someone with a bladder the size of a gumball, I can sympathize. With, uh... <laughs> a bladder the size of a gumball. I like that. No, no, but seriously. I also really there was love beer. and this this may be a little TMI. Pat, we'll edit this out if we need to. Uh, there was a Halloween <laughs> party I went to where I had two beer. I think I was 18 years old. I had two beers. I pissed five times. Impressive. <laughs> That's the kind of bladder I have. So doing an hour, hour and a half long podcast with a new beer every week, I'm starting to – usually I grab two <laughs> beers. Uh, I usually find myself struggling to keep it in. So fuck it. I just decided to go, hey, less calories too, right? I'm going to start a, a, you know, a keto diet again eventually. So yeah, a yeah. bit of liquor, a bit of uh, Alberta premium, just a bit of water. That's all you need, man. That's all you need. Fair enough. Sure thing. What are you guys drinking? All right. Um, I'm continuing on the tradition of trying to as well make appropriate uh, – drinks for the okay. episode i am drinking a <laughs> black cherry mike's hard lemonade <laughs> black cherry mike's hard lemonade <laughs> that's right oh my god because this book is so black and kane is so hard <laughs> i appreciate that and, and oh my god. I don't care if black it's cherry drink. is not this a is flavor delicious. of mike's hard that i've seen here though so i'm definitely gonna have to see oh. that when i get down there oh dude yeah. it's probably the it's best pretty dope it's pretty good. Of the uh, of the series, if you enjoy this kind of like uh, non-committal <laughs> alcoholic beverage, <laughs> then, uh, then uh, uh, you, you'll like. It. Right. Oh god, Drew, lay it on us, dude. So I do not have a uh, thematically appropriate named beer. Did you say thematically? But. but Sorry. Thematically <laughs> okay. appropriate Sorry. name. I've also I've yeah. also been indulging a little bit on the on, <laughs> in smoking, so I'm fine. Uh, go, sorry, go but, ahead. But the content is very appropriate, and uh, you know I mentioned earlier one of my favorite bits in this book is Kane's gradual realization that Turkild has a mug of scotch mm. across the table from him. So I have a, an American brown ale from Crowhop Brewing Company, aged in Scotch barrels. Ooh. It is a twelve point eight percent. Damn, it's just a just a, a whammy heavy. of a brown ale. It's super boozy. I mean, like, like twelve point eight If you, if you like whiskey, you're gonna like this beer. I mean, that sounds it, like it would give yeah. me a headache to kill me. Holy crap! Mm -hmm. Nice, nice brown yeah. ale. What the hell is a brown ale? Well, it's an ale. That <laughs> hold on, hold on. Let it's, me finish. It's usually like. <laughs> I'm going to assume that that one has a murky color to it. You assume correctly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's usually like kind of a nutty, um, it's not super thick, like medium bodied ale. I don't know. It's, it's fine. Huh. Like, you know. Shit, add it to the list, man. But yeah, so next week, obviously, we're going to be diving into Kane's Law. Mm. Uh, we're going to be reading just about half of the book, uh, at least like on, on our Kindle version. Um, it's exactly half. Uh, I think it was uh, through, what was it, The Mockingbird Test is the name of Mockingbird the chapter we will test. be reading through. 
Yeah. So we'll finish the Mockingbird test and then we stop. Yes. Good. Good yeah. to know. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and so this has been episode 17 now? 17 episodes we've had now. And for just future context, this is April 7th that we're recording this. Yeah. So God knows when this is going to come <laughs> out. I think it's going to be like mid-June, late June, early July. Who knows? I haven't done the math yeah. off ahead yet. So good. All right. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm Drew McCaffrey. I'm Rob Santos. Rob Santos and, yeah, and our special guest, Patrick McCaffrey. Thanks again, Pat, for coming on. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. I'll uh, see you guys when things get weird. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> oh, okay, let's do it. Have a good one, everybody. Bye.